God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Now we are having a wee bit of time in scripture. And what we've been doing, we've been knocking on the door of every book of the Old Testament. To see if Jesus is in there. Amen. Amen. And praise God, the light's been on so far in every book. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I was just thinking, if people would just read the Bible, they would get a, a fright. How is it possible that this book, written by over 40 authors, over 1,500 years, can sing one song? Because it wasn't the people, it was the spirit that was behind these people. Holy men of God, moved by the spirit of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's good to get real information. You know, people will be living in the communication age. The age of communication, there would never been so much miscommunication ever. We're living in an age of miscommunication. People are listening to the wrong stuff and getting the wrong messages. Uh, we are, this is just it's proliferate. The amount of message, in fact, there might even be people, I know there's people coming in there, eh, don't, don't want to embarrass you, but I saw on Facebook the other day, turn your clocks back. Did you see it? It's not true. You don't turn your clocks back at the end of the month. <laughs> and people will be, because they, they shouldn't they see a bit of information, they bite into it. And we've got to check our facts, check our facts. If people would check the Bible, they would see, wow. How did that know that? How is that reading my heart? You know, the Bible reads your heart and reads your life because God is in it. And we've been knocking on the door of every book of the Old Testament. Last week, we were in the book of Zephaniah. It's an Old Testament minor prophet. Not minor because it doesn't mean much as opposed to the major prophets. Minor because it's not very big. And we're in an even smaller one uh, today we're in the book of Haggai, if that's how you pronounce it, which has only got two chapters, two chapters in the, the book of Haggai, and then we come to the very last book, of the, we, we come to Zechariah, then the very last book, which is Malachi. So we've only got three books left in the Old Testament to chapter the door on. We can go back through it again, the whole thing, and I'll tell you something. We could go back to every single book of the Bible and find Jesus again. Again. You go to Genesis, it's multiple the amount of times that we get the Son of God presented to us. Uh, but what we'll probably do is move on into the New Testament. So we're in the book of Haggai, if that's how you pronounce it. Any Hebrew speakers here can help me out? No? Well, well the name Haggai, it's, uh, there's only one person in the whole of the Bible that's a, get this name assigned to them. Although the name Haggai eh, is quite identical to Haggai, and that's say eh, in the Bible. And he wrote his prophecy about 520 years before Christ. Now we're moving on. Remember, we were talking about the God's people being in exile, and eh, we know the prophecies that God would deliver them. 70 years would pass and they would be set free and we know that <clears throat> Cyrus the Deliverer came and uh, the Babylonians were defeated and the Assyrians, it was a different setup, and God used them to allow the people to return to their own land, to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. It was a time of restoration. If through their own wickedness and sin, God's people had broken the covenant and were taken away into exile. And we need to be careful that we maintain the spiritual life. We maintain the glow. We don't live on what we did years ago. We have to have fresh oil for every day. Is that right? Praise God. So it's one of the shortest books in the Bible. It consists of only two chapters or 38 verses. So listen. You've not got any excuse. Go home and read it. All right. Now, I know all right, if I come up with Jeremiah Rise there, he might say I've got my work to go to. But not with this book. Read it before you go to bed. And I'll tell you, it's only 38 verses. If you're in like me, you start nodding off when you're reading. You'll get through it before you nod off. There's only 38 verses. So read it when you go home. Praise God. So, the word 
Haggai, it probably comes from a root word which means to celebrate. Hallelujah! Something to celebrate. After all that time in exile and bondage and slavery under the wicked regime, and I tell you, it's starting to happen that somebody was praying this morning for the persecuted church. Churches are different parts of the world that function under wicked regimes that want them dead. God opens the door. And there is a move. The move is on. There's a rustling of the leaves in the mulberry trees. The spirit is moving and they're brought back. And this message is all directed to a man called Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, the governor of Judah. And God wants Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple. This man Zerubbabel, we'll mention him quite a lot, because he is the key person. There is another man called Yeshua, which is the exact same name as Jesus. He's in there as well. And he's the high priest. And these people uh, are very much uh, figures of importance in what God is doing. So, let's have a wee look at... uh, I want to show you something before we go any further. This man Zerubbabel is very, very important. And we're looking for Jesus and there he is right away. If you go to the genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew, that's the Christmas story. It tells uh, about uh, how Jesus Christ was descended from David. Remember when we were away back, we seen that the promise was given to David that there would be a king would come from his line who would have an eternal kingship. The son of David. You remember that? Genealogically, there would come someone who would be the king. But his kingship would be different. Every king that's ever lived has lived and died. And so he's basically died off the throne. He's no longer on the throne because he's dead. But he was given a promise that there would always be one who would always be on the throne. And how can that be? Because descended from him would come the eternal king. And when they nailed Jesus Christ to the cross, and we were thinking about that this morning, they put a sign above his head. Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews. And the high priests got very upset about that. They'd got their way. They'd got that man out the road. They'd got him executed. He was upset in their religion. And he said, could you take that sign down? Take that sign down. It was written in three languages. Latin and Hebrew and Greek. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. And I'll tell you something else. What God has written, he has written. When you see in the Bible it is written, it's speaking with authority. It's saying, when Jesus spoke to the devil, he said, it is written. In other words, it is not up for debate. It is the word of God. It is not up for challenging. We live in a world where we think, you know, by debate and meaningful dialogue and discussion, we can arrive at the solution. You're alive at some kind of man-made solution. But I'll tell you, when God says, I'm telling you in a moment what the world is doing. They're taking what God has said, and they're saying, oh, well, let's change it. We've got away with everything else. We've removed all the boundaries of life. Let's go further. I wonder how far they can go. And I'm not going to get into that this morning because it's a hot potato. But when God says it is written, it is written. You can do what you like. At the end of the day, you will bow the knee to God who said, my word goes. Do you ever work for a boss like that? I had a boss like that. Didn't matter what, everybody had great ideas and all the rest of it, and they would all pontificate, and then the boss would come out and say, this is what's happening, right? <laughs> you ever have a boss like that? Sometimes he was right. <laughs> but you know, when God says it is written, he's always right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So we... Look at the Jesus in the in the, the Christmas story genealogy and the book. There's two genealogies of Jesus. One is in Matthew, and one is in uh, Luke. And one shows the the genealogy through Mary. Mary is descended from King David, and she was a maiden who was chosen. And the angel came and said, "You will bring forth the Christ, that holy thing in you." will be called, you call his name Jesus, Yeshua, the same as that priest, which means deliverer, for he will save his people from their sins. 
And <clears throat> so we read, uh, you can read it all if you like, just read Matthew chapter 1, the very first chapter. And Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. That's what we've been looking at in the last few weeks. After the exile to Babylon, where we are today, we're talking about this time where they, they're allowed to return. You know, actual the river went back with 43,000 people. He took 43,000 people back and he started to reclaim the land. Praise God! We need to reclaim Scotland. Don't believe the devil has control. We can reclaim the land. Jeconiah was the father of Shelatil. We mentioned him. He was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abuhud. Abuhud. So we see this man, Zerubbabel, is an ancestor of Mary who brought forth Christ. So there's Jesus. An actual physical genealogy is coming down the descent from David. Now, in Luke, it goes down the genealogy of Joseph, who was supposed by them to be his father. We know that he wasn't. It was God that was his father. But in Jewish uh, culture, the, the genealogy of the husband was very important. But listen, Joseph was also a descendant of Zerubbabel. Maybe it came a different route. But he also was descended from Zerubbabel. The son of Matthias, the son of Simeon, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of Jonah, the son of Reza, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi. There he is. There's Jesus already. And this man Zerubbabel, he gets a prophecy all for himself. You ever had a prophecy all for yourself? I've had that. People have spoken. When I came here, a man stood up and prophesied. He says, your job is to transition this church. Ah. I knew that before he told me that. But there were the two, three witnesses. And God had given this prophecy. The Rubabal was given a prophecy by Haggai. That he was to go and build, lay the foundation of the temple. And he's a very, very important person in the plan of God. And you know what his name means? Zerubbabel means seed of Babel. It's a wicked name. It was a Babylonian name. Seed of Babel. Now, if, I was talking to Scott the other day about Babylon and the Tower of Babel. And all the way through the Old Testament, it is figurative of man's rebellion against God. And you read the book of Revelation. We're going to be doing that come Wednesday. We'll be looking at the book of Revelation. Babylon the Great epitomizes and symbolizes all the wickedness which fights against God. And one day God, God will not let sin go on forever. <clears throat> he has atoned for it. We are in a day of grace. Those of us who are not Christians can become Christians. <clears throat> the door is open. I took a funeral on Wednesday. For that man it was too late. I don't know if he was saved or not saved, maybe in his dying breath. I don't know. He knew he was very ill. But when you die, it's too late. You can't go back. But when you're living, you're living today in the day of grace when the opportunity is there to receive salvation. But there'll come a day when the day of grace will finish and God will deal with sin forever. It will be destroyed. And we'll be looking at that as we get into the book of Revelation. But this man Zerubbabel, according to the world, that was a name that was given to him by the world because he was a Jewish exile in Babylon and he actually worked his way up into a position of favour and he was given a Babylonian name, just like Daniel. You know Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Remember Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego that were cast into the fiery furnace? They were given Babylonian names and these names were the names the world pinned on them. But irrespective of what the name that the world pinned on him, in actual fact, he might have been, in their eyes, the seed of Babel. But he actually was the seed of David. Praise God! And Jesus Christ was the son of David. Jesus Christ is descended from this man. Who God mightily used. Are we back in the days of Haggai? These two chapters have got a lot to say. So we see then that this man... Is to be used of God. We see that later on, hundreds of years later, his descendant is Jesus Christ. Haggai chapter 2, 
Well, there only is two chapters. We'll look at a couple of verses in it. The word of the Lord came to Haggai. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Now what is a signet ring? Well, a signet ring was an engraved ring that a person in authority would wear. And they would plant their stamp on something. And they gave it authority. And God said to this man, You are my signet ring. You are my seal of approval on what is about to happen. My authority is on what you are doing. And the word of the prophet had spoken. So this man, the governor of Jerusalem, along with the high priest Yeshua. Now by the way, he did have another name. He had a Persian name because remember, Babylon fell, remember? And the, the Persians came and that was a deliverance. He actually, he was given the name Shesh Bazar, Shesh Bazar, which was a Persian name. Now it's got another meaning, but we'll not get into that, but it was to do with their culture and their gods. But it doesn't matter what the world's doing to you. What is God's name on you? I know some Indian people who have become Christians. And Pastor Yusupadan, who's preached in this church, Yusupadan means at the feet of Jesus. And many of Indian Christians, when they're born, they're named after a Hindu god. You know, it might be, uh, well, I'll not go through the names of the Hindu god, that's no helpful, but they, they don't want to be named after a Hindu god and they change their name. That's quite common in India. But this man, he was working within the plan and purpose of God through the politics. He was made the governor. I'll tell you something else. You know how Nebuchadnezzar took all the vessels out of the temple? When they destroyed the temple and they, they exiled all the people to Babylon. You know the, the Psalms by the river of Babylon. There we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. You know, hang your harp on the willow tree. You know all these, the feelings and emotions of a people taken away and put into bondage. Well, you see, you know, these people were going to come back. They were going to come back. No wonder his name, Celebrate, is a good name. And God is going to use him. But this man, who was made the governor of uh, of Judah, he was allowed to go back and be in charge on behalf of the Persians. He was actually given back the vessels of the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had taken. He was given them back. It was wonderful to have all these holy vessels that were used in the temple given back to God's people. So he's a mighty man of God. Praise God. So in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, Persia he led the first band of Jews, 42,360 people and some servants, who returned from captivity at the close of 70 years. You can read all about this in the book of Ezra. In the second year after the return, he erected an altar and laid the foundation of the temple on the ruins of that which had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And all through the work, he occupied a prominent place inasmuch as he was a descendant of the royal line of David. And just a wee note here. King Cyrus of Persia gave an elected leader of Judah named Shesh Bazar. Now we know that's Zerubbabel. Back all the sacred items that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had taken from the temple. Praise God. The Lord describes Zerubbabel as a signet ring. The ring was a sign of authority. And uh, you think about Jesus. See, when Jesus was baptised, what happened? God put his signet ring on that man who came out of the water. What happened when Jesus rose out of the water? It says that the heavens opened, there was a sound from heaven and a voice spoke. Remember the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and uh, he received the Holy Spirit bodily and a voice spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all in the one place at the one time. 
And that was God putting his signet ring on Jesus Christ. His authority was now pronounced to the world. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So thank God for the signet ring of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. So there's a parallel between these promises uh, and the, what Jesus did. When, as soon as he, was, he received this, Jesus went out into the wilderness, was tempted for 40 days, and then he went, began his ministry. Praise God, maybe that's why it's so important that we recognize the direct physical link, ancestral link of Jesus Christ and Zerubbabel. Now, what is the message all about? Now, we don't have a lot of time to do a complete Bible study. Well, if you read it, and I hope you do, 38 verses, you'll discover something that challenges us. When they went back and started doing God's work, now I've been ranting on about doing God's work and flashing a book about it this morning, the group book. The people, as people do, started to get lax, started to get disinterested. The level of commitment fell away down. They got back to their own land and after the flurry of excitement and the pilgrimage and settling down, they started to relax. And you know what they started to do? They started to build themselves nice houses. They started to build, the Bible talks about these panelled houses. And the prophet Haggai had to speak to him and say, you say the time to build the Lord's house is not now. In other words, we're busy attending to our affairs at the moment. Tomorrow, maybe, and the prophet had to speak and say, look, get your priorities right. Get your priorities right here. You're not over here to be an immigrant to make yourself a better life. You're here to build God's kingdom. Praise God. I thank God for every immigrant that's come to this country who has come and served the Lord. Praise God. But you read it. Indifference had set in. The priorities had gone out the window. You see, it's not time to build the Lord's house, building them their own houses of parallel wood, all thinking about their own house. What I want, what I want, what I want. And Haggai had to speak to the people. So Haggai and diag diagnosed the problem and he prescribed the remedy. Praise God. This interest was, resol was resolved by restating God's priorities. What do you want? What do you want? You want? Like, this is what God wants. Okay? Back to where we started. It is written. This is what God wants. Okay, I know what you want. I would like that too. I'd like a nice big new car. I would. I went and had a test drive in one, but I didn't get it. Ireland says, no, 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 no. <laughs> I would like these things. But God says... What's, here's my priorities. Your priorities take the back seat. Okay? Haggai diagnosed it and he prescribed the remedy. He stated what God's priorities are. And if we are listening to God, and I hope you all do, what is God saying to you? We went for a meal with a couple of the other week. And my, my, the fellow had been the best man at my wedding. And he, his wife... When we went for a meal, the first thing she said to us was, what is God saying to you today? Well, I could answer that, actually. I could answer it, because I have been trying to find out what God said. If somebody said to you, what is God saying to you? Would you know what God is saying to you? Or are you too busy building up a house of panelled wood? If you don't mind the, the parallel. So, Haggai, in this wee, this wee book, restates God's priorities. And the people became discouraged as well because although they were doing all these things, they were not going well. They were planting crops and the crops were failing. They were trying to make a better life for themselves and it wasn't working out. They were having trouble, they were having famine. And instead of things getting better for them, things were getting worse. And they were putting all their efforts and energy into it and they were getting discouraged. And Haggai 
he restates God's priorities, but he also reiterates God's purposes. What is the purpose of you being here? Now, some people go to the mission field, they don't expect to go and have a, a nice life, unless you come to the USA. <laughs> Have you ever met American missionaries? They take America with them. <laughs> I've met American missionaries. I met a good friend of mine. He was an American missionary. He went to work in Danoon. And they imported America with them. They bring it in big containers. And everything they have in America, they take with them. Okay. Anyway, that's between them and the Lord. But he said, your purpose is here as a missionary. Praise God. You're here to build God's work in this land. To these. And then... They were dissatisfied. They were beginning to complain. And Haggai reminded them of God's promises. Praise God for God's promises. Hallelujah. And you know this verse that we've just read today, I'm going to tell you one of the things that discouraged them. <clears throat> they were rebuilding the temple, right? That Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. But listen, it was nothing like the structure they were putting up was nothing like the one Nebuchadnezzar had knocked down. It was the one that Solomon built when Israel was at its heyday economically, the wealth that they had and the power and the extent of Solomon's empire was immense. He built a phenomenal temple in Nebuchadnezzar and the sinful breaking of the covenant of God's people brought that to ruin. What's happened to the church of Jesus Christ in Scotland today? What's brought the church down in this country? Why are the churches empty? A fellow texted me yesterday, Jim, do you know any empty churches? A pastor, friend of mine, want to buy a church. I could tell him quite a number. Empty churches, what about that one, what about that one, what about that one? Why? Why is the church in this country come down? The same reason it came, the temple came down was that God's people broke their covenant with their God. The boundaries came down and they were living in materialism, living in self-satisfaction and giving God second place. And all the time, the enemy was at work. I just heard in the news this morning, the, the humanists are saying, you know, people who get married in humanist weddings are more likely not to be divorced and are comparing it with church weddings. In other words, we are better than you. The Church of Scotland says, well, personally, we don't think it's anything to do with where the ceremony is. So, that's what's happening. If we had been a praying people, the Bible said, if my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. No, we decide, we'll have a committee. We'll have a discussion. We'll look at the problem. We'll sell off our surplus buildings and we will, well... Let's just go along with it, celebrate the fact that their other faiths are taking over the land. God help us. So we need God-given priorities, we need God-given purpose, and we need to take hold of God's promises in our life. Praise God. This applies to us, this wee book. I think this book, out of all the books, hits us, hits a nail right in the head. This generation needs this book because it signifies that we need to get our priorities back. Now, the promise that we have just read in this scripture, let's read it again. Verse 20, On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you my servant Zerubbabel and I will make you my signet ring. So that's the authority. But he says, I'm going to shake the heavens and earth. Verse 21. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and riders will fall by the sword of his brother. What he's actually saying, if you read it, is that ultimately and in finality, God's temple if you like will be greater than ever before greater than ever before this is prophetic into the future and if you looked at the other minor prophets that we studied who is going to bring this about it is the Lord Jesus Christ himself at the finality of all things the one that God has given to judge the earth has been studying in the Old Testament is Jesus Christ he will restore 
and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And what is going to come? He was told to go and build this temple, and that's what we do. We, we batter on in here, we're hammering and banging, we were in through the week, and we try to build a building. But we know that in our church, the church is not the building, it is his body. Praise God. So, when we draw our service to a close, this is God's time. It might be a dark time, but listen, this is the day of grace. People are still getting saved. If you're feeling disinterested, if you're discouraged by the challenges you face, if you're dissatisfied by your spiritual progress, remember God's call in your life is to become like Jesus. We have to become like Jesus. If you stop becoming like Jesus, the Bible said he had no place to lay. The Son of Man has no place to lay. He said he didn't even have a home. Did you know that? He lived in other people's houses. He said, the birds of the air have their nests and the foxes have their holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He didn't worry about buildings. Read it. When we focus on our God-given priorities, when we join hands, I praise God, that's what that wee group book is all about. Us joining hands, I'm semi-retired now, I told you that this morning. We've got to join hands if we want to see a church in Springburn. We're not going to pay a guy to come in and do it all for us. We're going to join hands and we're going to do what God wants each one of us to be. We need to know our ministry. We've got to fulfil God's promises and purposes. And we encourage one another with the promises. Together we stand. And we'll make a difference in the lives of many other people. And that difference will endure for eternity. Lead us so to Christ. And a million years from now they'll still be with the Lord in heaven. Don't tell them about Christ and let them die without how to get saved. They'll go to a Christless eternity. I know a lot of you help people, but the greatest help you can give to a person, I tried to do that on Wednesday when I, when I stood in front of all these people at a, at a funeral. And I know, according to the lady whose son died, he was only 42, the boy. She says, a lot of people weren't pleased. She told me. She says, but I was happy about it. And a lot of people were touched by it. But there's people who do not want to know about God. It scares them. Because they don't want to be answerable to God. But we're all answerable. The Bible says they're appointed unto men once to die, but after death the judgment. Praise God that we can be saved. Jesus gave his blood to pay for our sins. And he sent out He sent out the disciples into the world. He says, preach the gospel. In other words, preach good news. Tell them it's okay. He says the price is paid. Turn for your sins and call in the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. The door of heaven will swing open for you. Not because of anything you've done. Because all our righteousness is like filthy rags. All of sin can come short of the glory. But because of what Jesus has done. He's taken it for you. He's taken the punishment for you. You can be saved forever and for eternity if you'll only believe into him and trust in him. And that will be your plea to Christ. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all my sin. And you can die happy knowing you're going to go to be with Jesus. Or you can ignore it and forget about it and say I don't want to know. But I'll tell you, the appointment will still come. It will still come. Hallelujah, that God has given us a door of opportunity. And according to Haggai, the glory of the past, and I'll tell you there have been phenomenal things happened in this country in the past. There were the covenanters. (coughs) There was the revivals of Lewis, there was the revivals of Canvas Lang and Kothai. Phenomenal things have happened in this country. There was a time there was a Bible in every home in Scotland in this country. But the glory that's going to come is going to be comprehensive. It will be greater and bigger. And Jesus indeed will then be the desire of the nations. When he reigns and rules the world as he will physically. At the end of the age, in the day of the Lord. This small temple that Zerubbabel was building was only a shadow of what is going to come. But we have to do it. We have to do it. Do not be slack 
In well-doing, Paul says, as a manner of some is, let's find our ministries in Christ. Let's get on with the job. Zerubbabel was prophesied over by Haggai to get on with the job. Do it. And praise God he did. And in the fullness of time, his descendant came, Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world. Isn't God good this morning? Praise God. Now we're going to, uh, it's a very apt hymn we're going to close with. It's about our own meeting of Christ. Face to face with Christ my Saviour, face to face, what will it be? When the rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. We're going to close and uplift the Lord's offering. Uh, we'll remain seated so that we can have the offering and then we'll close in prayer. Now if anyone would like prayer with a laying on of hands, just come forward in the last verse. Thank you. Now I...